Hello, Canary Academy. This video will highlight the flow of data from the sender to the receiver to the historian. Now, whenever possible, the best practice is to keep the Canary data collector and sender components local to the data source. The receiver and historian tiles will most likely reside on another machine. For the purposes of this demonstration, the entire Canary system is installed on my local machine. I'm currently logging 30 tags via OPC UA, and we're gonna start by looking at the sender service. Now the sender is what we use to buffer the data and forward it along to the receiver. Within the sender, there are two different ways to identify a sender to a receiver. If I go down to the configuration tab, You see it populates three submenus, credentials, endpoints, and access. And as I said, there are two different ways to identify a sender to a receiver. You can use identity, which is typically the name of the machine and a randomly generated GUID. Or you can use Windows credentials. This would allow you to use an active service account that exists within your domain or active directory and has been set up for this traffic. If I go to the endpoint submenu, typically with the sender and our collectors, the net.pipe is being used, and you see it grayed out here. It acts as kind of a shared memory connection between collectors and the sender. Any clients on this particular machine automatically have access to the sender. And if only this box is checked, no external machines can access the sender. As I already mentioned as a best practice, we always try to install the sender and the collector as close to the data as possible. These components are usually installed as a pair, although in some instances they can be split across machines. The architectural versatility of our software allows you to enable the net.tcp port and have one of the collectors writing to the sender on another machine. Now, typically we wouldn't recommend this scenario because of the potential for the network to drop between those two components. The two SOAP endpoints are for a legacy configuration and are no longer being used. They still exist only for compatibility with older clients. Moving on to the bottom two endpoints, we have our web APIs. If there's a custom integration you need and we don't have a specific collector built for that protocol, you can configure a custom collector. The sender is what exposes our write API. So the write API lives on the sender service. The web API ports correlate to the write API allowing an external product making HTTP calls to log data. So this allows for custom integration and writing data into the historian, even if we don't have a specific collector for that protocol. The web API is used as an integration to the sender. And once all the data is written through the API using HTTP, it will buffer that data and forward it to the receiver the same way our other collectors do. Now, most commonly, it is the HTTPS endpoint that is being used because that way everything is encrypted between the client and the server. And if you're using HTTPS, you need a certificate. The certificate is how the data is encrypted and uses a set of keys. The certificate specifies those keys and is also used for validating. So this section is where you would look up the certificate. This domain has to match the domain that is used to access the machine. Shifting over to the access submenu, this is where you can configure who has access to write to the sender. This operates on a standard Windows directory pop-up. So if you wanna add, click add, and this is where the Windows directory pop-up will appear. From an administrator standpoint, you can look up a specific user account or set up a service account 
which is a user account created for a piece of software instead of an individual. Service accounts are typically used for software to communicate with other pieces of software. Then from a security standpoint, you can lock an account if you need to shut down the communication for whatever reason. So this acts as a gating mechanism to approve an account to be permitted to write to the sender. Now going back to the status tab, the status tab on the sender tile shows you the sessions that have been created by any of the collectors that are logging to the sender. And so right now we just have the one session. The purpose of this screen is for the admin to easily see what data is flowing. Any value greater than zero in the TVQ column means there is data buffering to disk. So to show you what this would look like, I'll go back to the home screen, go to my services, and I'll stop the receiver service. Now going back to the sender, we see we have TVQs building up and they're buffering to disk. I'll go back to my services and restart the receiver. And there you see the buffer data has already cleared out. Now, sometimes when a client is just setting up their system, they may make a mistake when getting things configured, and they may not really care about the data yet. So this purge button allows you to remove the session from disk. So that covers the sender tile. Now let's move over to the receiver. And again, we'll start with the Configuration tab. You'll notice the endpoints will look similar to the ones that were on the sender tile. Anyone writing to localhost will have access to the sender and receiver because it's on the same machine. If you have the username port configured, you can go into the Senders tab and you'll see a sender trying to connect. They would be denied by default if you only have the username port enabled. But because we also have the anonymous port enabled, anybody can connect. So we wouldn't have to manually allow a particular sender. Usually in a production environment, the anonymous port is not enabled. The certificate information is also the same for the receiver as it was for the sender tile. And one more thing to know about the receiver tile is if you have two different machines logging to the same receiver with the same tags, a redundant tab will appear at the bottom of the screen. And again, this will only populate if you have two different sessions writing the same tags. Okay, Canary Academy, so we have covered the sender. We've talked about the receiver. So now let's complete the flow of data and take a closer look at the historian tile. You've already been introduced to data sets within the historian, and from the database tab, you see my existing data sets. Let's take a deeper dive and we'll explore the submenus on the historian tile, starting again with the configuration tab. My data sets, including the file count and tag count, are listed here. We can create a new data set, giving it a name and choosing the path. And under Settings, the Validate box goes through in the background and verifies that the file links up with the previous file and makes sure that the structure of the file is correct. Typically, this box is always checked. You can also be notified if you are no longer receiving data into the data set by checking this box and selecting your desired time frame. This is a great way for system administrators to quickly be alerted of any connectivity issues. The rollover and rollup settings are usually not altered from the default settings. 
This helps keep data sets properly organized and structured. We default to daily files so that if there are any problems with any particular file, you can limit your data exposure to data corruption. You can also specify the amount of time you want to keep data in the historian. The default is set to never delete the data, but a custom setting can automatically purge data after a certain period of time. On the Settings submenu, the Background Validation is a global checkbox to globally enable or disable background validation, or again, you can do that individually per data set. You also have the ability to store properties externally. Within Historian Files, you have tag names and raw data and also any metadata properties. Now, in some circumstances, the metadata can actually take up more space in the file than the raw data. So in order to mitigate that, we've given you the ability to store those properties externally. So by checking this box, it writes properties to a SQL Server database or a SQL Lite database instead of storing them in the raw historian files. And this can result in a drastic reduction of the size of the files on disk. Now this is the name of the server and the name of the database that the properties are being stored in. There are two different methods to authenticate with the SQL Server. One is with a configured username and password. And checking that box would be for a Windows user. Again, this is used to configure the username and password for SQL authentication. Shifting to the endpoint submenu. The endpoints on the historian will look a little different from some of the more recent version releases. So we have gRPC built by Google. This offers a new mechanism to communicate with the historian over the network. This works the same way as our sender and receiver endpoints as far as access goes with anonymous and secure endpoints. And this screen will look familiar as well. The certificate section will also look familiar to the sender and receiver tiles. Going down to the Diagnostics tab, you can view different things regarding the performance of the historian. This will be helpful for a system admin to keep a close eye on the diagnostics and different activity occurring within the historian itself. So that wraps up the flow of data from the sender to the receiver to the historian. Hopefully this video gave you some insight into how these components work together within the Canary system.